So this revision video is going to examine some of the key characteristics of the catchment area of the River X and to consider how human activity is having an impact, both positive and negative, on that drainage basin. First thing we're going to start by looking at is the river regime for the River X that we can see on the left of the screen here. So the black line indicates the discharge of the river throughout the year um, and in this case running from October through to October um, 2019 into 2020. Um, we can see from the line on this graph that at its lowest point the river is averaging around about 4 cumex, 4 metres cubed per second. Remember that's our measurement of discharge. If we then look at the highest point over here in December and January, we can see it's just over 100, probably around 120 cumex within that year. So that's a very, very big variation in the discharge. We can also see um, that in very short spaces of time, the discharge of the river is rising very quickly and is also falling very quickly. It has the usual shape that we might expect from a river regime in so much as it's higher in the winter months through November, December, January, February, March, and then decreases slightly um, through the summer months. Although we can still see that some periods of rainfall within the summer um, are causing it to reach almost to the levels um, of the winter months. So it's very, very variable in the River X's regime. And we'll come on to think about why that is in a moment. These maps on the right hand side just give you a bit of context about where we are um, and where the River X's catchment sits within the southwest of England. So we can see that it starts its journey up on um, Exmoor. This area of high ground here, this is the upper part of the River X's catchment. So we have quite steep um, hills and moorland up on um, Exmoor National Park. Um, and that's collecting huge amounts of water, gets a lot of rainfall over that higher ground, um, and that's all being channeled into the river. The river's drainage basin then basically extends in a kind of long shape down this way, um, obviously with the River X meeting the sea in Exmouth, um, down here in the south of Devon. Even as we progress further down through um, the middle course of the river towards places like Tiverton, we can still see we've got some quite steep sided valleys here and here. Okay, so we've still got a relatively steep topography and it's not until you get towards the mouth of the river around Exeter um, where the gradient of that river starts to flatten out. The map at the bottom here gives us an indication of um, the main river itself, the X, and some of its tributaries like the Clist and the Creedy and the Baal. Um, and what we can notice from this is that actually the River X has a relatively high drainage density. Um, if we were to delineate the edge of that drainage basin around here, we can see that actually there's a very large drainage density um, in terms of having lots and lots of rivers and streams on the surface. And that is something um, that is important in terms of leading um, to this quite flashy regime that we can see on the left hand side. So if we now have a look at some other characteristics um, of the River X's drainage basin, we can really start to understand why the River X's regime is so flashy. The first thing we consider, um, as we've already mentioned, is the altitude and the steepness um, of the drainage basin. It's actually got a median altitude of 171 metres above sea level. That gives us an indication that actually um, over 50% of the land within the drainage basin is above that value. So more than 50% of the land within the River X's catchment is over 171 metres above sea level. We can also see this maximum altitude up on um, the heights of Exmoor is 516 metres above sea level. So that high altitude is important because upland areas receive more rainfall than lowland areas. It's also important because um, of the steep slopes that surround um, the river, which is going to be encouraging lots of surface runoff, 
um, and reducing the lag time when we do get rainfall events. The other thing we can consider is the land use within the drainage basin. There's a few notable things to pick out here. Um, the first of those is the apparent lack of woodland within the drainage basin. Only 13% um, of the River X's drainage basin is actually um, wooded in some way, so either deciduous or coniferous woodland. That's important because otherwise woodland would normally be intercepting precipitation, um, it would be returning water back to the atmosphere through evaporation and transpiration. It would be binding the soil together. So without that woodland, um, we are potentially experiencing more runoff in the basin because there is less interception. 23.5% of the catchment is what we would class as arable farmland. These are crops um, being grown in fields. And another 57% is grassland. Now most of this grassland will not be people's back gardens and playing fields and things like that. It will be agricultural grassland. So where we actually have um, the grazing of um, cattle or sheep, um, particularly sheep in the in the upper part of the catchment on Exmoor, um, but cattle lower down the catchment. So when we consider actually that 80%, 80.5% of the catchment um, is covered by farmland, we can start to see um, that this starts to have a big impact when we consider um, how farming affects the water cycle. Less important is the amount of heathland or, or bog or mountainous areas and certainly urban areas make up a very very small fraction, less than 5% of the land use within the drainage basin. That means that there must be other factors that are causing the hydrograph or the river regime to be this flashy. It doesn't just come down to the fact that we've got urban areas, even though locally those are, urban areas might be important. When we think about the whole drainage basin, there must be something else going on. Now, probably the most important factor influencing the discharge of the River X is actually its geology. So only 2.5% of all the rocks, all the bedrock within the basin is what we would class as being high permeability, so permeable bedrock. Actually, 93.5% of all the bedrock is either moderate or low permeability. That is going to mean that less percolation can be taking place. It means the soils are going to fill up quickly and that in turn is going to lead to more runoff. Moving on then, we can consider how this flashy river regime leads to heightened flood risk within the River X's catchment. This graph at the bottom here shows you the fluctuations in discharge over a much longer period of time. So this actually shows you over about seven years from January 2013 up to January 2020 and beyond. And we can see that typically the discharge of the river is falling between these two measurements here. OK, um, however, sometimes the river is getting up above um, those peaks or those or those kind of mean typical high point. So almost once a year, the discharge of the river is making its way above that sort of normal value. So this is maybe following some exceptionally heavy rain. We could get um, the risk of, of flooding within the River X's catchment. We can also see, actually, that in some places it's falling far below um, the, the normal value. So dropping down here where perhaps we've had a very, very dry spell that's caused that discharge to drop much lower. In terms of the areas that are at risk, approximately 11,000 properties um, are at risk within the River X's catchment. Um, that's when we consider maybe the 1% annual probability of a flood. So the sort of flood that might only happen once every 100 years. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will get flooded every 100 years, but those big magnitude events that occur less often, that's the sort of risk that is posed to these 11,000 properties. When we consider um, where those properties are located, we can see um, that places like Exeter and Exmouth um, and Tiverton, they kind of dominate the areas um, 
which have the most flood risk. And that's because, um, firstly, they're further down the course of the river, and also they are the sort of three large urban areas that exist um, within this catchment. Here we can see some photos of what the River X looks like when that discharge gets really, really high. So we can see in this photo on the left hand side how the discharge of the river has brought the height of the river right up um, to the edge of um, the quay along um, this part of Exeter. Um, the water's spilling over the sides here. It's only just about being contained um, on this side of the river. Um, it's certainly starting to spill over into some of these playing fields in the background. Um, a little bit of a closer up view here um, on the right hand side. So the River X isn't completely immune from flooding. It's not had any really, really devastating floods like um, some other rivers in the UK, um, certainly not recently, but it is at risk of flooding because of that very flashy river regime. It's important we now turn our attention to think about the impact of human activity within the drainage basin. Probably one of the most significant impacts in the River X um, is that over time, um, certainly from you know, the late 1800s into the 1900s, large areas of Exmoor in the north of the catchment were drained by cutting drainage ditches like we can see in this picture here into the landscape. Farmers were actually paid and encouraged to dig these ditches, to drain the water off the moorland, to make them more suitable for grazing cattle and sheep, um, to increase food production at the end of the Second World War in particular. Um, farmers were incentivized to do this, so they dried these moorland areas out by cutting these ditches into the peat and allowing um, that water to drain away into uh, the catchment. What that does is it means that that moorland no longer acts as a huge sponge of water to soak up all of the rainfall. So any water um, that rains onto that moorland now just runs off into these ditches and these ditches carry that water very, very quickly into the main channel where it makes its way downstream and poses a flood risk to places like Exeter. As we said earlier, a very small fraction of the drainage basin is actually um, considered urban, only 4.5% of the catchment. However, when we think locally within different parts of that catchment, um, those urban areas and those impermeable surfaces that go along with it, they become a little bit more important. So within Exeter, for example, we can see that we actually have um, a relatively high population density. Um, it is a small city um, and therefore the land use associated with that um, is going to be increasing the rates of runoff and adding to um, the problems of flooding uh, or the risk of flooding anyway within that catchment. A third important human activity is actually the abstraction of water. Now abstraction is the word that we use to describe um, when water is taken out of a river system um, for human use, so either for drinking water um, or possibly for agriculture. Now, one area that's significant within um, the River X's drainage basin is Wimbleball Reservoir up here. Um, it acts as a huge store of water within that catchment. Um, it helps to regulate the flows of the river downstream, so certainly um, meaning that the discharge um, of water heading towards places like Tiverton and Exeter, um, that is slowed down as a result of the um, amounts of water um, that are held within Wimbleball Reservoir, around 120 million litres um, of water held within that reservoir. That surface storage is really important in terms of influencing um, the discharge of the river um, and it's important to remember that this is going to provide um, a water supply for people. We couldn't really consider human activity within the River X's drainage basin without considering um, the impact of agriculture. Now, as I've said already, most of the agriculture that takes place within the River X's catchment is for what we would call um, pastoral farming. Okay, so the farming um, of livestock like cattle and sheep. Now, they have quite a significant impact on the flows of water within the drainage basin because of the way that they um, compact the soil. 
So you can imagine that all these cows wandering um, around on the fields all day, every day, um, they're quite a considerable weight. Um, they are, with their hooves, compacting the soil and trampling it down and squashing it down um, and meaning that it can't hold as much water. So as this soil gets compacted, um, it means the infiltration capacity is less. And we can see in this photo on the right hand side, this is a, a photo taken within, um, within the River X's kind of upper course near Exmoor. We can see these huge streams of water just running down the side of the hills here um, because of the way that that soil has been compacted. We've got very, very rapid surface runoff, all of that water funneling its way downhill straight into the main river channel um, and therefore leading to that quite flashy regime that we've already talked about. Now, it would be a little bit irresponsible to think about human activity within the River X's basin as just being a negative thing. There are actually steps that people are taking um, to actually reverse some of the damage that has been done and to actually put the River X back to a more natural state. One of these efforts is about peatland restoration, so actually trying to restore the areas on Exmoor that 50 or 60 years ago were drained by those drainage ditches that we mentioned earlier. So one project in particular is the Exmoor Myers project or Exmoor Myers partnership. This is an, a collaboration between Southwest Water and the Environment Agency and Exeter University who are monitoring the impact of it. Um, and their primary aim is to block up all of the drainage ditches that have been cut into um, into the peatland. We can see this digger on the left hand side of the screen here. It's picking up with its, its scoop a huge amount of peat, scooping that out of the, which is, you know, soil out of the moorland and using it to create a bit of a dam across that drainage ditch. What that's doing is it's causing the water to back up behind that dam um, and it's slowing down the flow of water across the landscape. And that does two really, really important things. As the water is flowing more slowly across the landscape, it's not picking up as much sediment. So fewer bits of, of soil um, are getting picked up and carried within that water. Um, and that means that when that water makes its way downstream and we take it out and we treat that water for drinking purposes, actually that becomes cheaper to treat because we've got less silt in there. And we don't need to spend money getting rid of it. So it's actually 20% cheaper to treat that water um, because it's not picked up as much sediment on the way. The other really important thing that slowing the flow does is that those regulated flows mean that the river is less flashy. It responds much more slowly to rainfall. That's because that rainfall soaks into the soil. It makes its way via through flow into the river. And that's a very slow transfer of water. Um, also helps to recharge the groundwater stores, which again store that water for a very long time. That means that in, air, in times of high rainfall, we are less likely to experience flooding in the River X. It also means that in times of low rainfall, actually those groundwater stores and those soil water stores, they're filled up and are, are slowly trickling water back into, um, into the river itself. It's cost over two million pounds to, to restore 2,000 hectares um, of land, but it has been really, really successful. Um, it also has quite successful impacts on the carbon cycle too. Because the peatland um, stays wet and it doesn't dry out, it doesn't oxidize with oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, and that reduces the amount of carbon dioxide that is entering the atmosphere. Um, peat is actually very, very rich in carbon. Um, it's ultimately what you get before um, uh, you, you form coal over the long term. If you compress that peat over millions of years, it would become coal. So it's very, very rich in carbon. And if it's wet, that carbon can't react with the atmosphere to form carbon dioxide. But if it dries out, that can happen. So by keeping it wet, we are also having positive impacts on the carbon cycle as well. 
We can see in this example of this photo here, just again, some other ways in which they've blocked up um, these drainage ditches, just with some um, little bits of wood, very, very low cost, very low tech. Um, and the water's still able to make its way through this and flow more slowly downhill, but it is taking that journey much, much more slowly and allowing more infiltration to happen. The final thing to say about this, this peatland restoration is the fact that it encourages the growth of um, this moss that we can see in the photo here. Now this moss here, this is called um, sphagnum moss. That's the name given to this type of moss that we can see. Kind of loves growing in these kind of wet boggy pools that exist on the moors, uh, um, you know, on, on the side of the hills. Um, sphagnum moss acts like a huge sponge as well and soaks up a huge amount of water. It can hold actually 20 times its own weight um, in water. So it's a very, very effective means uh, of absorbing that precipitation in the upper course of the river and not letting it make its way downstream. These two photos here just show you the difference between the before and after situation. So before the area was restored and then after it was restored. And we can see on the right hand side just how much more water um, is being held on those moors and allowing um, to be infiltrated into um, the moorland itself. Um, so the estimates that they've got um, are that more than 6,000 Olympic sized swimming pools of water um, are now going to be held within that catchment um, rather than that flowing down into um, towns like Exeter and uh, causing problems with flooding. As I said earlier, Exeter University have been involved in this um, project and they've been particularly involved with the monitoring of the sites. So they've been measuring um, over a long period of time um, the height of the water table, so the depth of water below our feet and how high or low that level is. Um, and what they did is they put 19 um, of these little sensors, what we call dip wells, um, they put these into the into the ground and they wanted to use those to, to see how much more um, water was being stored within, within the moorland. Um, and what they came to the conclusion of was that these restored areas are storing a third more water than they would have before. So they've increased that storage by 33%. What that's done is then meant that we've seen the water table rise by 2.2 centimetres across the whole area. Um, and that's equivalent to an increase of 110 cubic metres of water per hectare. So if we take into account that they've restored 2,000 hectares and each of those hectares is storing 110 cubic metres of water, that's a really, really significant amount of water. And we can see how we can add up to those 6,000 Olympic sized swimming pools that we mentioned earlier. So in summary then, the River X has quite a flashy river regime and that's predominantly because of its impermeable geology which is made, made up about 63% of the geology. The lack of woodland, which only accounts for about 13% um, of the catchment, and the steep topography, particularly in the upper course um, and the middle course of the river. Human activity is having and has had a significant impact in the drainage basin. Agriculture and water abstraction and urbanisation are all having an influence on the stores and flows of water within the catchment. However, there's been a shift more recently from human activity having a negative impact to human activity having a more positive impact. So that Exmoor Myers project is a really good example um, of how they're in regenerating that moorland, enabling it to retain more water and ultimately regulate the flow of the river.